I hope, but but for the next five weeks, we're going to talk about these things, and next week, we're going to talk about marriage. So we'll, there'll be a little bit about marriage today. If you want to know more about what the Bible says about marriage, we'll talk about that next week. The following week, we'll talk about dating, okay? And so uh, uh, then after that, I think the next one we're going to talk about is uh, temptation, and the last uh, week, we'll talk about purity, okay, and the importance of purity. And so uh, just kind of a little rundown of what we're going to be looking at. But this morning, we're going to dive right in and look at this uh, topic of sexual intimacy from a biblical perspective. And the title of the sermon this morning, it, it was very good, okay? Uh, and uh, I, 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 want, I was going to put sex in front of that, but Christy about had a heart attack. And so I just decided to kind of leave it a little bit uh, vague there for everybody, but... But uh, hopefully you see, this, this is creation, and, and, and what I want to point out is after God had finished creation, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more, God created Adam and Eve, and He told them to multiply and fill the earth, and so He commanded them to, to, to have sex, okay, and, and make babies and that kind of thing, and at the end He says, and it was very good, okay, and so what I want you to understand is right off the bat, is this, this is something from God. Okay? It's good. Everything God made is good. Okay? So that's where we're going with this. Hopefully you'll see more about that as we get through. But, you know, we live in a sex-saturated society, don't we? I mean, you, when you think about it, uh, we don't even really have to think about it too much. But this, this uh, weekend, there's going to be a new movie out based on a book. Some of you may have read. Maybe not. I've not read it. It's called Fifty Shades of Grey. Okay? And uh, I've not read the book. I've not watched the movie. Uh, but, you know, I've heard a little bit about it, and, you know, uh, I know enough about it to know that uh, I think the way it's depicted is not God's way, okay? And so I think it's just a, one of those, another depiction of the failing morality or the falling morality in our culture. Um, you know, the three-letter word sex is probably the most misunderstood word in our society, but we talk about it all the time. I mean, it's just a subject that comes up everywhere. You, you turn on the TV, TVs and movies are filled with it. Um, you know, innuendo and content, magazines feature sex appeal on the covers, both for men and women. The internet is absolutely covered with sex, commercials, and, and the porn industry boasts um, revenues of over $20 billion a year. Of close to $20 billion a year. That's more than professional football, baseball, basketball, all the teams combined. And so we've got a cultural problem. And so the church cannot be silent with this. And that's the reason we're doing this series. I think it's uh, utterly very important for us to talk about this, okay? And so when we talk about, when we talk about sexual intimacy, there's a few different perspectives. And I want to talk about it psychologically just for a second so we kind of understand viewpoints. You know, everybody's going to have positive and negative experiences uh, from, from sex and you know and that, that's one of the appeals that's used to sell stuff uh, is the psychological factor you know they use sex to try to sell everything but you know beer pharmaceuticals cars I mean you see it all the time don't you and so then sociologically it's also affected it's a driving force you know there's a lot of pressure it pushes teens to to engage in sexual activity it causes adults to uh, you know pursue uh, extramarital relationships, prostitution and escort services and all these things that drives teens toward to, to premarital sex and you know and in a political world you know you, you've got the potential a lot of times it'll either make or break your career you know and uh, we, we've seen those kind of things just just in news reports but you know think about this sex is discussed <coughs> in our schools in our doctor's offices, in our public arenas, it's discussed in private gatherings. It's talked about everywhere but church. When you think about it, isn't it? And, um, you know, rarely discussed in, in church. We can <coughs> just sweep it over in the corner. And what we're doing is we're letting society tell us what the standard is. That's what we've done by being <coughs> silent in the church. And there's a lot of talk about sex. But there's very little truth about sex out there, you know. And so, well, our goal is with this series is to help us understand the truth about what God says about relationships, what God says about sex, what He says about marriage, what He says about dating, temptation, and purity. And so that's what we're going to, that's what we're shooting for. Because look, 
God knows better than anyone else, and He understands what sex means. He, you know, and, and He knows what the purpose of it is. And so for us to completely understand it, let's go back and see what He says, okay? So that's what we're trying to do. And uh, for us to, to begin having a little bit better understanding, I want us to look at a passage of Scripture. We're going to look at Genesis 1.27 later, but I want us to look at Romans chapter 12. We all make sure the air is turned on. Uh, it's, it's a little warm in here, so... Uh, all right, so in Romans chapter 12, uh, this is kind of a little uh, background, a little basis for us to get some foundation to understand some of the stuff we're talking about here today. Uh, Paul was writing to the Romans, and he, he gave them this passage in Romans chapter 12. He says, I, I appeal to you, or I beg to you, or I beseech you, brothers, by the mercies of God. Look what he says, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. And he says... Don't be conformed to this world. Don't be made just to look like everything else in the world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing or the renewal of your mind so that you can know, so that you can discern what the good and perfect and acceptable will of God is. Okay, that's what Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2 says. And so I want us to pay particular attention to a couple of phrases here. Number one, to present your bodies or to give your bodies to God. You see that? Give your bodies to God. Give your sacrifice to God. Give your life, your living, give your body to God. That's who it belongs to. And then the second one is this one where it talks about the renewal of your mind. And this is, we got to change the way we think in order to know what God's will is. Okay? And so these are important verses. These are really important verses for us as Christians to understand. And, you know, so... What I want you to understand here is we're talking about our bodies and we're talking about our minds. You see that? They're connected. Our bodies and minds are connected. And God created us that way. They work together. Y'all understand that, right? Uh, but, you know, when God created you, God created you as one with your body and your mind. But our culture has this sort of distorted philosophy where we separate body and mind. You know... When, when, and so what happens is the body and mind, they get at odds against one another. And from a st sexual standpoint, that can lead us to two types of things, two viewpoints. One of them is Puritanism, and one of them is Hedonism. Okay? Puritanism is sort of a legalism, and uh, it, it, throughout church history, you read about it sometimes, and it's when Christians have elevated the mind so far above the body that uh, some, some men castrate themselves to prevent themselves from engaging in sexual immorality. So that's where, you know, they take this mind so far above the body that it, it, it becomes a dangerous thing to try to remain sexual, sexually pure. Now most of us are more familiar with the other side of this coin, and that's the hedonism side. And that's, that's when we uh, elevate the body over the mind. And hedonism basically says eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow you may die. Enjoy your body, do whatever, and it don't matter because the body and mind separate. Just do what feels good. Okay? And that, that's kind of where most of us fall in our society today. Uh, live it up, you know? I mean, and, and, and don't worry about it because it doesn't affect your mind. But that's a lie. That's a lie. It does affect your mind, you know? Uh, just think about it. Can you think of, you know, a lot of the things we've done in our body, if you really, really begin to think about it, we've all things, done things with our body that, that we replay in our minds. You cannot separate them. And, you know, that's what God is trying to show us. So that's wrong thinking. And, and the problem is, when we live according to this false truth, and we practice that way, then what, what it brings is suffering. It brings pain. It brings disruption and, and, and destruction. So, you know, you're going to suffer regret. You're going to miss out on the life that God wants you to live when you don't do it His way, when you do it your way. And so, well, what we're looking at when we look at this area of sex and relationships, you know, we can, we can trace everything back to a lack of understanding about the truth. Either we don't understand the truth about sex and how God created us, or we just ignore it. may understand it, but we just choose not to do it God's way. And so that, that's what it all comes down to. But, but So my job today is to help us at least understand it. Okay? And then hopefully through the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in us, we can practice it. And, uh, you know, but God created us as sexual beings. 
And he has a design for love, dating, and marriage. And if you want the best relationships, then you need to do it God's way. Live out God's design. Live it to the best of your abilities. Now, Chris and Brady's already heard most of this stuff because I married them and I took them through marital counseling. So they're going to get a rehash of some of the stuff. But, 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 you know, this is what it's about. So what I want you to do today, Rob read me about having three points a day. We're just having two, brother. So two points a day that I want you to see. Two basic truths about sex, okay, from God's perspective. That's what we're going to be looking at. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we can break them down. But these are the two main ones I want us to see. Number one, I want us to understand this. We've already mentioned it, but that's this. God created sex. It's God's idea. Everybody give God thanks. Amen? <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, Christy's, Christy's going, go on, go on. All right. Uh, but, but God created us as sexual beings. I mean, He, he made us that way. And so, and, and like I talked about, when God created sex, it was before the fall. Sex is not something that came after the fall. It was before the fall. And so, some people find it embarrassing to talk about sex. Just like earlier when I said, hey, we're going to talk about sex today. Everybody's eyes sort of look like silver dollars there for a second, it seemed like it. You know, maybe some of y'all didn't know about it. But, but the thing is, you know, we get embarrassed about it because in our society, uh, some of us, you know, we kind of tend to think of it as being something bad most of the time. Uh, but really, it's something good that's used for bad a lot of the time. So that's, that's what happens with nearly everything that, that, you know, but everything that God creates is for good. And, uh, you know, a lot of people think, hey, God, God doesn't want us to any, experience any fun or any pleasure. You know, that somehow God set up all these rules and regulations in the Bible so He could just suck the fun out of life. But that's not the truth. Listen, you know, that, that's just not the truth. Hopefully we'll, we'll reveal more of that to you later. But, 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 you know, even as Christians, a lot of times we, we're guilty of promoting that, that false understanding of, of things. But, but when it comes to sex and issues related to sex... A lot of times we as a church, we're known more for being what we're against than what we're for, don't we? And that, I hate that because, uh, you know, we, we can kind of get a bad rap. And that's one of the things we're trying to change about the culture with the fellowship church. We want to be known for, for loving people, not for being uh, separatist and, and puritanist or whatever. I mean, you know, we are who we are. But anyway, I'm getting off. But, 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 but here's, the, here's the thing. Man didn't invent sex. God invented sex. It's God's idea. And I want us to look at the, uh, Genesis 1, uh, verses 27, 28, and I'm gonna, we're going to skip down to verse 31. You can read the whole passage if you want, but these are the verses that are kind of key here that I want you to see. So if, if this is after God has created everything else. This is on the sixth day. And on the seventh day, He rested, right? So He's, he's created everything that there is, and each day after He created, when He was finished, what did He say? And it was good. It was good. It's before the fall. And so then he says on the six days, after he created some of the animals, he says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Look at how he made him. Male and female. He did that on purpose, y'all. Okay? He did that on purpose. And, and he created them. And he says, and God blessed them. And God said to them, what did he say to them? Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and then give them dominion on their, over everything. And now look what he says down in verse 31 at the end. And God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. It was very good. In the beginning, it was very good. It was very good. And so, that includes sex. That includes sex. If you do it God's way, it's very good, right? Uh, and it's interesting, you know, God says two things here that I want us to really pay attention to. God tells them to, bl He blesses them and tells them to multiply. So we, in, in this passage, we see two primary purposes for sex. And that's what I want us to talk about for a second. <laughs> Number one, we're not going to spend much time on, be fruitful and multiply. Because everybody understands, I think, that, that when you have sex, you, 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 can, you can have children. That's how God designed it, right? That's the primary way we produce children. And uh, nowadays, and with new technology, obviously, there's other ways. That's the reason I said it that way. But, but, uh, but that's how God designed it, isn't it? And so, for procreation, God says, multiply and fill the earth. And, uh, oh, man, I could camp out here for a long time. But I'm not going to because I've got to stay on track. But, uh, <coughs> but Christians, those of you who love Jesus, have babies, please. 
You know, I'm just telling you, we, we need more Christian families in our world having babies. Somebody say amen. Amen. <laughs> All right. All right. Now, if you want to know more about that, I'll, I, that's, that's after, okay? But the second purpose that we're going to talk about this morning is one we don't talk about much, and that's, that's pleasure. God created sex for pleasure. And so... Um, we, we don't think of, of it that way, maybe a lot, but, but God's just, let's, let's think about this. God just created male and female. The only two people in history never to go through infancy, the terrible twos, and puberty. All right? God created them as adults, didn't He? And uh, he, he, uh, he tells them to multiply and procreate. We learned their names in chapter 2. This, this is all rehashed, and we learned that it's Adam and Eve, and He goes into more detail about the creation, how He took Eve from Adam and all that. And, uh, and we'll probably get into some more of that when we talk about marriage next week. But, but he created them in a marital state, okay? They, they were united by God right from the beginning, okay? So here we got a couple that never was not married, except for I guess Adam was single for, until he had Eve, right? But, 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 but God's plan, and so here it's a simple plan, okay, that we see God's plan for sex is one man and one woman inside of marriage. That's God's plan. And, you know, Scripture, scripture uh, supports that over and over. And, and if you want maximum sexual fulfillment, that's God's design. That's how you're going to get it. When you get out of those boundaries, that's when you, that's when you, you seek sexual pleasure in other ways. That's when you get burnt. Okay? And, and, but God's view is really simple. Inside of marriage, sex is wonderful. But outside of marriage, it's dangerous and destructive. <coughs> it's offensive. You know, to both the one who created and the one who chose. Now, look, look, everybody can see this. Now, some of you might want to deny it, but take a look around in our society, in our town, in our state, in our nation, and in the world, and look at all the relationships that are busted up, people, you know, having sex with whoever, and you can see the destructive relationships and all the chaos that it brings. That, you know why? Because it's not God's design, that's why. We don't do it God's way, it brings nothing but trouble. That's just the way that it is. Alright? But, but God created sex for pleasure inside a marriage between a man and a woman. To enjoy that way. Okay? And I'm going to support that with a few scriptures. We're going to hit them kind of quick. I don't want to spend too much time on them. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, you can read this. And Scripture says to married couples, be careful not to spend too much time away from one another. Uh, because, uh, you know, and so he, he's telling them, you know, to, to not abstain too, too much. Okay? That's what he's saying. Because he's, he's encouraging uh, us to enjoy one another. In Genesis chapter 26 and verse 8, the, the Bible says that Isaac was sporting with his wife, Rebecca. Okay? That's one of the translations. That's one of the words. Now, the Hebrew word for sporting here, I assure you, does not mean playing checkers. Okay? Uh, and so, uh, that's what we're talking about. And now, there's another text in Deuteronomy that says this. It says, when a man is married, that he should take a year off from work. I hate I missed that one. <laughs> but, but, but anyway, because once he gets married, he's supposed to spend that next year cheering up his wife. Learning how to please his wife. That's what it means. And that the Hebrew word for cheer, cheerful, and it includes a profound sense of intimacy. Okay? And so uh, that's what we're talking about. And so that's just in the first couple of books of the Bible. Uh, there's a whole book called the Song of Solomon that is considered rated R by a lot of societal standards, okay? It's a little bit difficult to read in, in, in the original translation, and you have to have a little bit of cultural context to understand it, but it's about the intimacy between a man and his wife, and it's so explicit that ancient Jews wouldn't even let their young men read it until they were 30 years old, okay? And so... I guess it's a lot clearer to them than it is to us because you really have to dig in it to kind of understand some of what's going on. But it's clear enough if you know what I mean. So, but anyway, if God created sex and if the Bible tells us that it was created for our pleasure, you know, we've got to understand God knows more about, more, more than anyone else, how we can get the most pleasure from it, right? I mean, it's His idea. And so we, and, and, but too often what we do is we mess that up Trying to do it our way instead of his way. 
you know, and, and a lot of people say, oh, God, he, he's just keeping us from having fun. He's just a kid <coughs> doing But no, listen, when God says no, there's a reason for it. And so our model from the very beginning was found in Genesis 1, before the fall, with Adam and Eve. And look, unfortunately, we don't know a whole lot about Adam and Eve's marital relationship. You know, one thing we do know is that they were married for a long time. <coughs> Probably the, one of the longest marriages in history. Adam lived 900 years. And the Bible says he lived 900 years. We know Eve died before him, but we don't know exactly how much before him. How many kids can you have in 900 years when you've got a perfect body? All right? A bunch. A bunch. Yeah, a bunch. Uh, you know, and, and so when somebody says, hey, if Adam and Eve had Cain and Abel and Seth, where did, where did Cain's wife come from? Or where well, the answer is Adam and Eve lived 900 years and they had a lot of babies, okay? So the, these guys married their sisters, all right? And, and, and there wasn't any, there wasn't any, uh, yeah, there wasn't any, uh, what do you call it? Uh, incest back then. We weren't worried about the DNA back then. They, they had pretty much perfect bodies, you know? That's the way God designed it to start with. So that's the answer to that. But anyway, getting off subject again. But, but Adam and Eve were lifelong partners. And, and, you know, they were placed in this perfect environment in the Garden of Eden. And uh, we know the story there. But <coughs> since that time when Adam and Eve sinned, they, they grabbed that fruit and they pulled it down and they disobeyed God. Ever since that point, what we find is that, that uh, the rest of human history uh, has been, uh, been a, a, a decline in our values and in our morals. And, and that, that includes the area of sex. And it gets to the point in Romans chapter 1, when, when you read Romans chapter 1, Paul's writing, and it says that God gave them over to the sinful desires of their heart, to sexual impurity and the degrading of their bodies for one another, men going after men, women going after women, and all these other things. That's what Romans 1 says. And it, it's just the epitome of sexual immorality. And that's what happens when we leave God completely out of our lives. We don't go God's way. In our day, we tend to worship the body. And when we do sex our way, that's what we're doing. We're worshiping ourselves. We're worshiping our body instead of worshiping God, the creator of the body. And that's what Romans 1, 1 is talking about. Worshiping created things rather than the creator. Only the creator is worthy of worship. And so we need to focus on him. And so from... The Garden of Eden until now, we've devalued sexual intimacy. And we don't do it God's way. That's what we do. God created sex and it was good. But we've disvalued it. We've disvalued it. So we got to elevate it. And that's point number two. God created sex and God <coughs> elevates sex. You see, we think we're taking sex to another level. But what we're really doing is bringing it down. God's way is the highway. You know what I'm saying? You follow me? God elevates sex. We've lowered it, but God elevates it. So, you know, God holds sex to a higher standard than what we do. And, um, you know, every when God talks about sex in the Scripture, He places sex alongside of love. Okay? Y'all understand that? It's alongside of love. Inside the marital context. Love and sex are God's idea. He brought them together. And God created us in a way where we, we would desire that. We would want that loving relationship. He created us as emotional beings. Uh, and emotions are good. God used those to bring us to Himself and, and to bring us close to others. And, and, and you know, and, and this, this, when we think about this, this comes in contradiction with Darwinian theory and evolution. Okay? Because when you think from the evolutionary aspect, you know, ultimately... You know, the evolutionary aspect says you've got to have sex and, and propagate the species, you know, further the species. And if you look at how we're created, when we understand, you know, that as humans we're both sexual and we're emotional, so there's sex and love, it just don't make any sense in evolution. Why do we need the love? You know, if all you're doing is trying to, trying to have more and more babies to keep the species alive, love don't make any sense. You know, but it makes sense with creation and with God. Because that's who God is and that's how He designed us. And God designed both. God created us both as a body and a mind. And, and, and in a sense, you know, God elevates sex over this philosophy of our day to just live however you want to and do whatever you want to. 
And you know, when we see Adam and Eve in the garden pulling down the fruit, devaluing God's law, and that's what we do when we when we do value God's law. It's, there's a metaphor there. You know, we tend to think as humans, you know, whatever God elevates, we tend to lower it. And we've done that with, with sexual intimacy. And you know, a lot of times we, we devalue the truth of God. I mean, you know, um, have you ever heard anybody tell a dirty joke? Everybody's heard a dirty joke, right? And, 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 and if you ever responded in this way, get your mind out of the good. Y'all heard that, right? Get your mind out of the good. Your mama's probably told you that before, right? Uh, but, but, you know, that's what we say to them. And so when you think about it, that's what we do is we devalue stuff. We, you know, we think of it as being in the gutter. And God, God's idea is elevated, you know. And, and what we do is we take, we have to take God's view. And um, but we tend to elevate instead of ele elevating God's view, we'll elevate the body over the mind or the mind over the body, and that leads us to justify our actions, don't we? That's what we do. But you know, it's okay because you know, because of this, and we begin to justify things. Oh well, you know, it, it'll be all right. You know, uh, we're planning on getting married anyway, or or uh, or, or, or you know. Well, I'm not going to go anywhere else. Y'all know what I'm saying. Um, you know, it, it, we do it with pornography. Hey, you know, it's just in my mind. It doesn't affect my marriage. It doesn't affect my relationships. Uh, it, you know, and we rationalize ourselves to make it okay for us to have casual sex, premarital sex, what pornography and all these things. And uh, it's just a lie from hell. It does mess with your mind. It messes with your relationships. And it's destructive is what it is. And we know it is because we've seen it. But yet, so often, we'll continue to participate in it. So, we, you know, we lower the view of the mind. And when we do that, we can rationalize just about anything. And, you know, we fall in all kinds of traps where we can engage in all kinds of sexual immorality. And so, here's what we need to do. Instead of devaluing the design of God, we need to embrace God's design. Embrace it. Just say, you know what, God? You're the Creator. Your ways are far and above my ways. And I'm stupid anyway. I need to just follow Your way. Because then I know at least... And you know what happens when we do that is we'll be blessed. Instead of devaluing God's design, we need to embrace it. Jesus faced that problem in His day. He noticed that in His day that people had lowered their view of sex. And, and in Matthew chapter 5, uh, it leads us to this passage where uh, Jesus uh, said this. He, he said, you've heard that it was said to not commit adultery. But look what He says. But He says, I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And then he gets pretty serious on how to prevent it, don't he? And so, but, but look, this is what he's talking about. You know, he says, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. He says, it's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. That's how serious this stuff is. <coughs> we dismiss stuff, we dismiss sin like, ah, it's no big deal. Let's, let me tell you something, it's serious to God. Serious enough for him to send his only son to <coughs> suffer a cruel death on Calvary's cross in our place. That's how serious it is. But 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 Jesus says, look, when he when he gives them this, he's saying, you not only cheapen adultery, but you cheapen lust. And and you fall into the idea that what happens in your mind doesn't affect your body. And so what he's trying to help show is that mind and body, they're not separated. You you do this in your mind. It's a sin just like you doing it, you know? And so, that's what happens when we lower our views. But God sets the standard of sexual purity high. God elevates sex. And because God elevates sex, sexual sins are some of the most damaging kinds of sins that there are. Sexual sins rip families apart. They, take, they, they destroy lives, children. Uh, are hurt. Um, there are all kinds of psychological impacts. And that's what happens when we deviate from God's plan. And it leads us to pain and suffering. Now look, I know there's a lot of folks here that have experienced emotional and physical and spiritual pain because of you know, misusing sex in a lot of different ways. Sometimes it wasn't even of your own choosing. You know, 
molestation and maybe rape and these kind of things. I hear about these things all the time. You know, but, but if we're honest, many times it's because we've chosen to participate in sexual activity in a way that doesn't please God and that wasn't part of God's design. And a lot of you guys have done that, and you know, we have too. I mean, the pain of pornography, the, the pain of homosexual experimentation, multiple partners, you know, uh, out, any kind of sex outside the marriage between a man and a woman is going to get you in trouble. It, 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 you know, but here's the thing. I want you to understand. You know, the unfortunate news is we can't go back and undo what we've done. You know, there's just no way to do that. But what, what you can do is you can find forgiveness. You can be forgiven. You can find freedom from past sin. You don't get a do-over, but you can get a restart. You know what I'm saying? You get a restart. You start today <laughs> living and doing it God's way. Okay? And 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 you know, we're gonna <coughs> include you, you know, because because God's gonna include you, you know? Uh, we're gonna try to love you. But you can from this day forward begin to give God your best. First Corinthians six verse eighteen. This is what Paul told the Corinthians. He said, Flee from sexual immorality. Look what he says. He says, Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. And look what he says. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You're not your own, for you're bought with a price. Glorify God with your body. Glorify God with your body. So he's talking about sexual immorality here in particular. And, you know, Our body as believers is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God resides in us. And the Holy Spirit's a gift from God. You're no longer your own. <coughs> Paul told the Galatians in chapter 10 verse 20, he says, he says I, I don't even, I'm not even living my life anymore. It's Christ that lives in me. He says, I've died. But Christ lives in me. So that's who we are as believers. We're no longer our own. We've been bought by the blood of Jesus. So we need to use our bodies to honor God. And today you can make that decision. You know, you can say, from this point forward, God, I'm going to honor you. I'm going to make a decision with my mind to honor you with my body. You know? When you determine to live your life according to God's plan, you can get God's blessing. You know? When we think about sex, uh, you know, a lot of times in our society there's a lot of words used that, uh, to describe sex that describe, uh, that also describe fire. So I'm going to give you an illustration. You know, your, you know, your hormones rage out of control, like a fire raging out of control. You, know, you have burning passion, you know, and, and, and sex is a, a lot like fire when you think about it. You know, I mean, fire, when it's under control, can serve a great purpose. You know, you can heat a home, you can light a room, you can cook food. But when you let fire burn out of control, it destroys everything in your path. Listen to me for a second. How many of you are going to go home, build you a little fire in the middle of your living room, and heat it up on the floor? Nobody's going to do that. You know why? It'll burn your house down. <laughs> And you got to put that fire in the fireplace or in the wood stove or somewhere where you can contain it, don't you? Same way with sex. If it's not in a marriage between a man and a woman, it'll get out of control and it'll burn your house down. That's, that's the illustration. That's God's design. And you know what? You know, you can, and so this morning I want you to understand you have a choice. You can live your sex life apart from God and you can leave a wake of destruction in your path. Or you can choose to live that life God's way, the way He created it, and you'll find that God will bless you. And so if you want a blessed bless life and a blessed sex life, do it God's way. And, and God's way is very simple. Right? Get it from Genesis 1. Go back to Genesis 1 there, Lexi, please. You know... Well, excuse me, let's go to Matthew chapter 19 because Jesus quotes that there. Did I have that one up there, Matthew 19? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there we go. Have you not read that He who created them from the beginning, He made them? How did He make them? Say it with me. 
male and female. He created them. And he said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and cleave. Cleave. I like to say cleave. Anyway, we'll talk about that maybe some more next week. He'll hold fast. Be glued to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. And what God has joined together, what does it say? Let not man separate. When God brings you together, don't let anybody separate you, you know? And, and so, but, but God's way is simple. One man, one woman, fully committed to each other inside the bond of matrimony. Marriage. And that's where you're going to find max, maximum sexual fulfillment, okay? And, and so the issue becomes... You know, are you going to surrender to God? Or are you going to surrender to His way? And so, some of you here this morning, as we get ready, you know, for a time of response, I, I just want to—I want to—I want to ask you. Some of you may hear, maybe you've been in a battle with God. You maybe you've been running from God, and uh, you've been away from God. Maybe today's the first time you've been to church in a long time, but 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 you want God's best for your life. I mean, I'm, everybody wants God's best for their life, don't they? Uh, you know. You want God's best because the pain, maybe the pain of living outside of God's best is, has gotten too much to bear. Let me ask you something. Why, why don't you surrender your life to God this morning? Why don't you stop trying to do things your way and give your life to Jesus today? Stop trying to do it your way and do it His way. Simply say, God, I'm going to follow you from this day forward. I'm going to do things your way. All right, let's do that this morning. Father, we come before You right now. We thank You for who You are. Lord, we pray that You'd help us today to walk in Your ways, forget our own, to surrender to You in faith, and to, and to follow You. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God, speak into your heart. Come on, let's get on our knees before God. Let's give, give our life to Him. Let's start living from this day forward His way.